Hello and welcome to the LCB Smith Show. My guest today, all the way from Australia, is Fran Sheffield. And the topic is homeopathic treatment for autism. What difference does it make? Our focus is going to be very much on treatment for autism. And I have to say right at the beginning that nothing on this program that gets said here replaces anything that your medical doctor or your general practitioner tells you. This is my view and these are Fran's views. So, Fran, welcome to the show. Thanks, Elsevier. Lovely to be here. How did you get into homeopathy? What is it that triggered your career? Well, I've always been interested in healthcare and I have a background in nursing and midwifery. So that, that was always what I wanted to do, something in that area. And I was actually mm -hmm. expecting my first child. So I was coming towards the end of my pregnancy and I had a few problems. And my husband, of all people, was reading up some antenatal books or mothering books and said, oh, it says here that homeopathy can help this. And he's the most unlikely person to do it. But he said, look, he said, I'm going to see if there's a homeopath in the area. And fortunately, there was. And he booked me in for an appointment with her. So I'd, mm -hmm. I'd vaguely heard about homeopathy and I'd vaguely felt that it was a very quaint, old-fashioned sort of thing. But I went off to this homeo homeopath and I had some really good results. And with the birth of my baby, we went back again. And um, uh, I, uh, with my second child, I went back. And by this point, I was thinking, this is amazing. I have never seen anything do what this homeopathy does. So I started to study it myself. But it wasn't really until I got into a homeopathic college that I realised the extent of illness and disease that homeopathy can treat. Up until that point, because mm -hmm. I'd just been going with simple acute problems, I thought it was just something, a uh, home help sort of thing or uh, you know, coughs, colds, fevers, things like that. But when I got into college yeah. and I started to realise everything that had been treated, you know, right through history with the, the master homeopaths, really severe disease and pathology, I went, wow, that's when I was really bitten by the bug. And I've just studied mm -hmm. and practised homeopathy ever since. Okay. So, so what is homeopathy and how does it heal the body? Right. Most... Uh, most other sim sim systems of medicine treat by actually trying to remove the sy symptom by opposing it. So say, for example, if somebody had um, diarrhea, uh, they would give a, a medicine that would bind up the bowels or create constipation in the hope if they mm. gave that medicine, it wouldn't cause constipation, but it would stop the diarrhea. And that's how mm. other medical systems work. Homeopathy is very different in that it believes that the symptoms that are being produced, such as diarrhea or the headache or the itchy skin, are part of the overall imbalance and the body's struggle to correct that imbalance. So if it gives substances or remedies that mimic those symptoms rather than try and suppress them or oppose them, it helps the body with what it's already trying to do and it intensifies its health self-healing efforts and the body's able to heal itself more quickly. So homeopathic remedies yeah. mimic uh, uh, mimic the symptoms that the person's already mm -hmm. sick with. So in the case of diarrhea, homeopath would give a substance that would cause diarrhea in a healthy person. And in giving sudden thing that causes diarrhea to somebody who already has diarrhea, uh, it supports the body in what it's already trying to do and a self-healing effect takes place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, now this, we're going to talk about children and autism. Yes. Um, children can't tell you where the pain is. And with autism, there isn't necessarily pain. So how mm -hmm. do you identify what it is that you need to treat in them? Right. So if a parent's bringing a child with aut or a baby with autism to me, a lot of it is about observation and taking, collecting mm -hmm. the symptom totality, as we call it, or a picture of the complete range of symptoms that child has. So during the consultation, I and other homeopaths would be observing, is the child anxious? Is the child running interference and wanting the parent's attention all the time? Does the child avoid total interaction? Does the child avoid eye contact? And not all children with autism do avoid eye contact. Uh, so a lot will be coming by observation and how that child's reacting in different situations during the consult or if we're doing it by Skype you know I'll often be seeing the child on Skype or I'll be asking the parent 
How does your child respond in this situation? What happens here? What happens there? We also look at things such as food likes and dislikes or foods that aggravate the child, sleep patterns, how they react to things in the environment such as noise or animals or hot weather, cold weather, uh, whether they sweat easily. Uh, sweating patterns, uh, what their basic fears and anxieties and anxieties are. Are they frightened of thunderstorms or big dogs or being alone? And we put together a symptom picture out of all of you know, all of that information that comes back in, and then we go looking for a remedy that matches that complete symptom pattern, and that's the remedy that matches the body completely in its imbalance and what how the body's trying to correct the imbalance. We give that remedy, and it supports the body in its own efforts, intensifies that self healing effort. So, so is is that why? Well, I don't know if this is true or not. But is, is, is that why when you do a, take a homeopathic remedy, the symptoms get worse before they get better? Yes, that sometimes happens, but it doesn't have to happen. But it's actually the sign of a very good remedy if your symptoms do worsen. It just means that you've had that first dose of that remedy was a little bit strong for what you needed. So you're not only experiencing mm -hmm. your own symptoms, but you're getting some of the mimicking symptoms of the remedy as well added into the picture. Mm -hmm. So everything seems to double up or worsen for a short period. As the remedy leaves the body, the symptoms uh, settle down again and then you go on to the improvement. So that's a really interesting thing about homeopathy in that other medical sy uh, systems, the remedy or the medicine works while ever it's in the body. With homeopathy, it's as the, the effects of the remedy leave the body, then you get that self-healing response from the person's own body coming in and it's the body itself that's creating the improvement. So I'm often telling people, when you're getting better, it's not because the remedy is still there. The remedy is well and truly gone. It's your body's mm -hmm. own response to that remedy that's creating the improvement. You mentioned that the remedy can be too strong. Is, is that, yes. yeah? Why would that be? Um, it t depends on the person's sensitivity. Some people are incredibly sensitive to homeopathic remedies. Most people aren't. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's great to actually start using remedies in liquid preparations rather than pill preparations. But you could, because you can actually mm -hmm. dilute it down if the person overreacts or over responds to the remedy. Um, Yes, it's basically the person's own sensitivity. The other thing that comes into play, the closer the match of the remedy is to the person's symptoms, the more sensitive they are to it and the more strongly the stronger the response will be. So again, uh, sensitivity to a remedy is not such a bad thing. It often indicates a very close match between symptoms and remedy. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with autism in children, from what I've heard, from what I've read, from what people have told me, there is such a variety of symptoms. Mm. From, uh, you know, turning words the, the wrong way to being afraid of noises to, oh, goodness, there's, there's, there's such a long list. Um, food intolerances, that I think would be fairly easy to treat because it's, it's obvious, but lack of social skills, no sense of danger. Mm. Um, it just goes on and on. What do you treat? Now, you, you did say that you right. treat the whole picture, but yes. the, the whole picture surely is different for every person, for every child. Yes. And this is where the skill of the homeopath comes in. So say, for example, you said a child with no sense of danger. If uh, a parent told me that symptom during a consultation, mm -hmm. that's actually not enough for me or another homeopath to prescribe on. We need to know if there's no sense of danger because the child, there's a lot of bravado and overconfidence in the child, uh, whether the child completely lacks some awareness about their environment so they don't even realise there's danger, uh, mm -hmm. or whether they... Uh, in the case of injury, they have, you know, some children just don't feel pain when they hurt themselves mm. when they have autism. So, therefore, there's no recognition of danger because there's never ever been a sensation of pain previously. So, all of those different things will indicate different remedies. So, we've got to ask why, why, why? Um, mm. And in that case, it makes it easy because we can actually individualise a child. We've got to know why there's no sense of danger or why the child is frightened of thunderstorms or why the child avoids looking. For some children, it's a case, again, they're very fogged and they're not even aware another person's there. Another child it, uh, can be, I'm not going to look at you. Um, 
who are you in my little world? Uh, I don't have to answer to you. For another child, they're extremely anxious and frightened and they'll avoid for that reason. So again, it's finding out why the symptom is there or, or why the child is reacting and responding in that way. And those differences, they're the differences that indicate the different remedies. Now, you treat a lot of children uh, uh, with, with, with autism. And I want to ask you this question. Homeopathic remedies are diluted to the point yes. where there's, there's just about nothing or from what I can gather with some of the remedies, it's not even just about nothing. It's just the mirror image of what you started off with. So yes. how, do, how do you know that this actually is effective? I mean, you, you're treating them with water effectively. Yeah. Well, firstly, because the, the person responds to it when we give it to them. And I tell people visiting me, if there's no change within two to three doses of the remedy, I've got the remedy wrong, contact me. That's how quickly with, say, a case of autism, we're expecting to see some sort of change. And the frequency of dose can vary with sensitivity, but, but for people of an average sensitivity, that would be a two times a week dose. So parents should be seeing some sort of change by one and a half weeks. Uh, yeah. The other reason that we know that the remedy works is because even though it's very potentized and dilute, uh, there's no trace of the original substance, we can actually give that remedy again and again to a healthy person. And after a while, they start to exhibit symptoms of that remedy. And that's how we actually test what our remedies treat. We test them on healthy people. We write down the symptoms that they experience under the effects of the remedy. Then we test it out in clinic when somebody comes in with unwell with that combination of symptoms. If we get the remedy, mm -hmm. we get self-healing responses to that remedy. So oh. people people yeah. say homeopathy, people unfamiliar with homeopathy say homeopathy lacks science, but in actual fact, homeopathy is the most scientific system of medicine because mm -hmm. we're always working with that fundamental law of similars that what a substance can produce in healthy people, it will treat in sick people. And we test that law again and again in clinic and it holds true. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can testify to, to an overdose of homeopathic medicine where a homeopath told me to take, some, to take a dose three times and I understood <laughs> three times a day. And I ah. took it three times a day for a week. Mm, <laughs> the, the what effect, happened? The was not... <laughs> well, I, my, my skin actually started peeling off. It was Rastox that I took and, and ah. it, was, it, it, it was not pleasant. <laughs> she was horrified yeah. when I told her what I'd done. So, so and, you, uh, what you had it? A, yeah. Yeah. You had a little proving trial. You would have, um, so if you come across somebody who has peeling skin exactly the same <laughs> as you had, you'd know if I give them rust tox, I'll actually help them. <laughs> but just one dose, not just one, and not once a day, yeah. just one. <laughs> Yeah, and it says what the response is, and some people may need a daily dose, other people may need a dose once a fortnight, mm -hmm. depending on their response. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, what is the youngest child you've ever treated effectively? Because children can't lie. They can't say that they feel better. Oh, babies, babies still on the breast, babies not long after birth. But for example, a baby who's uh, refluxy, not taking to the breast, uh, vomits whenever they feed. And in order to prescribe for that child, I'll be looking at, uh, does this child prefer being held? Does this child prefer lying by themselves in a bed? In which case, uh, which position do they seem to be most content in? Uh, what are they like with movement? What are they like if you undress them and expose them to the cold air? What are they like? Like if you wrap them up, um, do they seem to be alarmed when other people are around or do they seem to be comforted when there's the presence of other people around? Uh, does the child sweat on the head or back during sleep or when they feed? All of these things indicate remedies and so we prescribe on that basis. Fortunately, the younger the child, usually we need to draw from a, a, fewer, a smaller range of remedies. As a person develops and their personality develops and they've met more stresses in their life, the field of remedies that they may need opens up and becomes bigger and bigger and we've got about all three the numbers go up and down but it's about 3,000 4,000 homeopathic remedies we can draw from but as with most yeah. things there's, there's probably about 200 we turn to again and again and again and they meet 90 percent of complaints but with a, a little baby you're probably looking at about 20 different remedies 
initially that are key baby mm -hmm. remedies and we just pick which one according to the symptoms the child's presenting with. So that's really fascinating. The symptoms you're looking at, it's not what only what they display physically uh, or, and emotionally, but also how they interact with their environment. Yes, yes, because we're looking when the body's in a state of imbalance, you know, conventional medicine, for instance, will treat the dermatitis or eczema separately to the migraine and separately to the ingrown toenail, whereas homeopathy mm -hmm. understands that those are usually all interconnected and they're not different yeah. problems, they're actually all part of one imbalance. So even with homeopathy, you can treat the migraine separately to the ingrown toenail. But it tends mm -hmm. to be an acute treatment that you need to do again and again. You don't actually get to the bottom of things. Whereas if you combine all of those problems and the related symptoms around them and prescribe a remedy that covers that range of symptoms, you treat much more deeply and everything improves and you get much more of a curative response rather than just a short-term improvement. Mm -hmm. Do you have any theories about what causes autism? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly in the camp that um, because my own children were affected that vaccines are a huge contributor and antibiotics. You get the combination of vaccines, antibiotics and quite possibly paracetamol or acetaminophen as well and it just seems to be disastrous for our kids. There are a range of other things too, uh, you know, environmental toxins that seem to be causing problems uh, but the fact remains and I see it in my clinic and the limited studies we have on this area because they, they make it difficult, if not impossible, to get funding to, to do them, is that children who haven't been vaccinated are far, far, incredibly less likely to have autism. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a definite, definite link there with vaccines. I think vaccines overstimulate the immune system. You then start to get a whole range of autoimmune problems coming in or lowered immunity actually so then the child goes on and gets ear infections tonsillitis things like that off to the hospital you get antibiotics as soon as you get the antibiotics you start to disrupt the gut flora you start to get gut dysbiosis toxins leaking through leaky uh, gut uh, then effects on the brain and it just compounds Mm -hmm. uh, there was this, I, I don't know what's come of it, but there was an observation made that over in Cuba that they had a very similar vaccine schedule to the United States, but they used a different anti-inflammatory for fevers. So rather than using uh, Panadol or acetaminophen, they used their own proprietary product. And they said, mm -hmm. so it was said at this time, I, I don't know whether it's still holding true, that they had very low rates of autism compared to the US, even though there was a similar vaccine schedule in place. So people at that point of time were questioning, could it actually be the uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen causing or contributing to the problem as well? Because the increase in the autism e epidemic occurred at the same time, parents were told to stop using aspirin because of the risk of Rett's disease and to change over to Panadol. Mm -hmm. And back then, I don't think it's advice that's being given these days, but parents were told to give the Panadol loading doses on the way into before getting the vaccine. So there was Panadol in the system to combat the fever that may follow and so if Panadol is implicated um, yeah so to, like from my perspective yeah. I see those those three things as being big contributors mm -hmm. and of course those are, those are three areas that homeopathy can help with homeopathy not only treats it has preventative effects for epidemic diseases um, the, we've got mm -hmm. significant historical and current data on that that should be looked at more closely uh, Homeopathy treats fevers quite nicely and acute problems that would normally need antibiotics. Homeopathy manages those very well as well. And even the childhood diseases, should the child become sick with one of the childhood diseases, homeopathy has numerous remedies that manages the symptoms there very well too. So if homeopathy is more widely known and more widely used, there'd be very little to fear with childhood diseases. And there's no side effects? No, no side effects. Occasionally you'll get that little bit of a worsening or aggra aggravating effect that we spoke about, mm. but that's purely energetic. Yeah. That's not toxic or chemical. That's just the energy from the medicine. As soon as the uh, remedy leaves the system, 
those symptoms settle mm-hmm. down. It's not a poisoning chemical effect. I often tell parents uh, they take away 20 ml bottles of uh, liquid remedy with me and they give drop doses. But I tell them, if your child was to swallow the whole of that bottle, it would be quite safe. Mm-hmm. If you phone up uh, poison information services, that's what they tell parents too when sometimes children have got into the, the remedy bottles or home use kits and so on. And the poisons information yeah. services advise parents as well that if it was homeopathy, it's quite safe. Mm-hmm. Do you use something like royal jelly in your treatment? No, I don't. I'm just a homeopath through and through. So I do advise people a little bit on dietary advice, but in terms of a lot of um, herbal medicines, royal jelly, cannabis oil and so on, they can certainly seem to help and improve symptoms. But from my perspective, it's still not getting deep enough to actually correct the imbalance that's causing the symptoms. It just relieves the symptoms for a period. A little bit as um, aspirin or Panadol would for a headache. It relieves it for a period. Maybe the child will or will improve while ever that conventional medicine is in the system. Maybe they won't. As soon as the medicine leaves, the symptoms will come back again. So I tend to uh, just work with homeopathy. And that's not to say that these other things are bad. They're actually much gentler and yeah. and safer than conventional medicines, toxic medicines, but they may not get deep enough mm-hmm. to actually create that or trigger that self-healing response that homeopathy triggers. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you mentioned cannabis oil, not just cannabis. My, my mm-hmm. personal view is nothing was ever created for people to smoke. So <laughs> don't smoke cannabis. <laughs> don't uh. smoke cannabis. You were, you were not designed for that. But if you want to try and use cannabis oil, by all means, mm. see if that could help for you. Now, we, we've talked about the children with the, um, uh, the autism. Um, I've seen parents that where the, an autistic child really takes a toll on them because it's a 24-hour mm. job. And there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of... Um, social stigma around this. What can you do for parents to help them cope with the situation they are in? Well, practically, uh, a lot of parents are are doing a lot of ABA, speech therapy, biomedical approaches, going back and cooking from scratch in the kitchen, having to filter out foods. Homeopathic treatment reduces the need for a lot of that. So firstly, financial uh, burden is reduced with homeopathic treatment because mm-hmm. the treatment's relatively inexpensive compared to all of these other things that they're having to do. But in terms of parents' emotional state, it places a huge toll on the family, uh, not only the parents mm-hmm. but the other siblings who have to uh, make allowances for the child who has autism, their behaviour, for the parents having to spend so much time. So we we can improve that child's coping abilities. If, uh, for example, they're inclined to jealousy or resentment or anger or hostility, homeopathy can bring balance Mm -hmm. back into their lives. So those emotions are more easily processed and managed rather than the child always reacting with hostility or anger or grief Mm -hmm. that they're not getting as much of of the parents' attention. For the parents, the parents are often in grief themselves or uh, peddling on all wheels trying to to do everything they can to help their child or in a state of depression where they've just gone into collapse because it's all overwhelming, everything that you need to do to help this child unless you just accept my child has autism and you put them in the system and you just let them cope the best they can and develop the best best they would without bringing in supportive services. So um, the parent who's feeling... Well, firstly, if we help the child and and the child starts sleeping better at night, the parents start sleeping better. If the child Mm -hmm. starts to eat a larger range of food where they may be restricting their own food because they're gagging on textures or don't like taste, if we improve that, suddenly meal times become easier for the parents. If the food intolerances are reduced, the child can naturally eat a larger range of food without the abdominal pain, the diarrhea, Mm -hmm. the constipation. Uh, We can help the parent cope with their own grief over the situation or stress or or just having so many demands placed on them that they can't meet them all and so they become irritable or overwhelmed, uh, anxious themselves, what's going to happen to my child? Yeah, so that homeopathy can help all the way around, not only the child but the parent as well should they have treatment or if the child's just having treatment because there's improvements there, some of the stresses are reducing for the parent. Indeed, indeed. Fran, this has been very, very insightful. 
Um, I want to tell people about your website, which I'm going to show on the screen now. And I want to do that because I received your newsletter, which oh, is one of the most, well, not one of, but hands down, the most informative newsletter that I've ever received. I really oh, thank enjoy, you. enjoy it, look forward to reading it all the time. Mm. Um, so when, if people want to contact you for more information, they can do it through the website. Yes, and there's a newsletter sign-up box there too, so they can get the same newsletter. One thing that they, they may be interested in is we have a webinar coming up in September, uh, Easy Homeopathy, you know, the basics of homeopathy, how to use it in the home for simple self-treatments such as fevers, mm -hmm. cough, colds, diarrheas, insect bites, bashes, bangs, sprain, strains, um, and also when, to go, when you need to see a practitioner. Uh, what a practitioner can help with. So it covers a lot of information there. So they may be interested in that as well. Well, I would encourage people to, to uh, dip their toes into the water with that kind of webinar. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's been really informative and I really appreciate your time on this. Oh, thank you very much. I'm passionate about homeopathy. So it's wonderful to talk yes. to talk about. I hope I haven't talked your ear off. <laughs> no, not, not at all. Thanks, Fran. So we'll meet again next week, same, same place, same time with another interesting topic. Thank you and goodbye.